I'm not usually one to browse racy websites, but one July evening a few months ago, I found myself not only visiting such a site but also signing up for their premium service. It seemed like a reasonable $100 investment. I tuned into a live stream where an attractive woman and a well-built man were deeply engaged. While I've seen more compelling videos, there was something particularly striking about this one. The woman, referred to as Hot Housewife Jen on the site, was actually Kelly, my wife. As the action unfolded, Kelly's reactions were unmistakable, the same expressions I had seen intimately many times. As I watched, she reached a climactic moment, visibly overwhelmed by the experience. The website, aptly named Nature's Pleasure Spa, seemed to fulfill its promise, showcasing natural desires. After the session, Kelly lay on the bed looking completely content. The man, smirking, commented on the quality of their encounter, suggesting it surpassed anything her husband could offer. Kelly responded with a confident smile, well, Mario, that certainly was something. But just so you know, nobody understands me like my husband. I've had my experiences, but he truly makes me happy. You did well, but he's in a league of his own. Keep driving, though. She flashed him another grin. Mario looked at her quizzically and asked, Well, if he is so fantastic, why are you cheating on him by coming here and letting me do you? She replied without losing her grin, I didn't plan for it to happen, but I like to have sex and I am glad you service me. I also do it because I can get away with it and you will never know. I actually love my husband with all my heart, and after three nights here, I realize how much better he is than what I get here, and it makes me love him and appreciate him all the more. She laughed and added, Actually, I probably am doing him a favor by coming here and doing this, so get over here and drill me some more. Like I said earlier, the $100 was money well spent because I was able to see what was going on with my loving wife for a lot less than surveillance equipment or private investigators would have cost me. You're probably asking yourselves how I got here, what transpired before that night to make me go to this site. It's a good question, and I guess the most honest answer would be a fluke, a rare piece of good fortune that turned my way. Not good fortune that my wife was screwing Mario, but good fortune that I now knew she was cheating on me. Kelly and I have been married for just over eight years. We first met when we were in elementary school together. We grew up in a small town in central Illinois. She lived in town and I lived out in the country. Her father owned the largest grain elevator in the area, and my father owned the largest grain farm in the area. Because our parents did business together, it was natural that we would meet, go to school together, and be friends. I won't bore you with the grade school crushes, the high school romance, or even the college scene. We both dated other people, we had not been exclusive with one another, but deep down, I guess we always knew that we should be a couple. Oh yes, I was indeed the one who took her virginity, but along the way, there were others for her and for me. It was in our junior year at the University of Illinois that we decided to become exclusive, and sometime later, I asked her to marry me. About a year and a half later, one week after we graduated, we were married. We both received degrees in business administration. Life was good, at least I thought it was, until that night in July. Let me continue. Three years ago, Kelly's parents retired and moved to Phoenix, Arizona. Kelly, her sister Amber, and her two brothers Tom and Carl Gentry bought a 48% interest in the grain business from Tom Sr. He wanted to retain controlling interest for a few years to add his financial backing to their growth. Eventually, he would begin to decrease his interest until they owned it 100%. Amber is married to a friend of mine, Walter Swanson, Wally, who also happens to be a grain farmer. He operates a farm that is just a few hundred acres smaller than mine. We live quite close to each other and spend some good times with them. Tom and Carl co-manage the grain business, and Kelly is their controller slash bookkeeper. Amber also works at the facility, dealing with customers and processing grain sales transactions, etc. It is a true family-run business with a few additional employees, mostly truck drivers and grain handlers. During the peak of harvest season, they employ a few part-time workers as well. I guess that's enough background, so I should continue with the sordid tale of how I discovered my wife screwing another guy online and what happened after that discovery. All four of the Gentry children had spent a huge amount of extra time putting together the deal for the purchase of the interest in the grain business from their father. I wasn't involved very much in it, but I knew they had to work hard to get the deal done. 
There were bank meetings, meetings with the Illinois Department of Agriculture, and meetings with insurers. All of them were burned out after the deal was done. Fortunately, this all took place during the winter, which was their slowest time of the year. For me, it was after harvesting time, so I didn't need Kelly on the farm as much as I would have during my two busy times of the year. She didn't actually do any of the farm work herself, but with 2,200 acres in corn and soybeans, both of those times are extremely busy for me, and I needed Kelly to run errands and help me out. You get the picture. Since we were not busy, the girls, Kelly and Amber, decided they wanted to take a few days to go to a spa to relax and unwind. They booked a three-night getaway at an appropriately named spa called Princess Spas. I know I mentioned Nature's Pleasure Spa, but that was the name on the website. The real name of the spa was Princess Spas. The girls came back so relaxed and rejuvenated that they decided to do it again the following July, after the planning season was well over. They booked another weekend. It was during that weekend spa visit that I was viewing the video online. But how did I ever find it? Dan Marvel, the field agent for the Illinois Department of Agriculture in our county, happened to stop by during a routine tour of his area of responsibility. Kelly and I had known Dan in college, and he asked about her. I mentioned that she was on a getaway at Princess Spas. Dan gave me a funny look and said that something unusual was happening there that I might be interested in checking out. He said a cousin of his used to work at that spa as a masseuse and had told him some pretty wild tales about what went on there. He said they even had a website with a different name. He didn't recall the exact name but thought it had something to do with pleasures. I asked him what he was talking about and he cautiously said he didn't really want to go into it but that I should check it out. Well, you don't know me, but I am an internet poker. I go online and poke around looking for interesting stuff and occasionally hit spicy sites, but usually just other interesting stuff. So, that evening, I did some poking around and found Nature's Pleasure Spa. It didn't take long to find the live feed, and the game was on. Now, I can tell you all about what happened that night, but you already know. I was hurt, I cried, I yelled, I got angry, I got depressed, I went through everything a man would go through when he found out his wife had cheated on him. I soon discovered that it wasn't the first time she had cheated either, because Nature's Pleasure Spa had an archive folder, and I was able to find videos from the previous two visits as well as videos from the two previous nights Kelly and Amber had been there. With the premium membership, I was able to download each of the videos for an additional $20 each. I downloaded the two videos from their first visit, three from their second visit, and three from the current trip. I ended up with eight videos in total at a cost of $160. So, for a grand total of $260, I had all the evidence I would ever need to divorce my wife. I just didn't have a plan yet on how I was going to do it, but I knew it had to start right away. I wouldn't wait a month or two weeks or even one week to bring it about. As far as I was concerned, the quicker we parted company, the better. She had screwed another man a minimum of eight times, and I had video proof. Actually, she had screwed at least two different men, Mario and Steve, on the videos I had downloaded. I didn't know, and I didn't even care if there had been more. Two men and eight times was more than enough. I made a few copies of the videos on DVDs and put them in a very safe place. When my father built the house, he had a wall safe installed with access through a hidden panel in the built-in bookcase in the office. Once the copies were safely hidden away, I deleted all references to Nature's Pleasure Spa on my computer and removed all of the original files. Other than the DVD copies, there was no longer a trail to what I had as evidence. When all of that had been done, I got my cell phone and sent a text message to Kelly on her cell phone. Kelly, this is Jack. I happen to know exactly what you were doing at Princess Spas, and I have evidence to back it up. Don't bother coming back to the house. If you decide to come back here at all, this house is no longer your home, and soon I will no longer be your husband. We're finished. My lawyer will be in touch with you in the next few days. Arrangements can be made at that time for you to pick up your personal possessions. Apparently, Kelly had turned off her cell phone and didn't get my text message until the next morning because I didn't hear from her that night. But early the next day, my phone started ringing. I could see by the caller ID that it was Kelly, so I didn't pick up. Soon, I heard her leaving me a voicemail. Jack, what in the world are you talking about, honey? I have no idea what is going on there, 
but why on earth would you text me such awful stuff? Amber and I are packing up now, and I will be home in a couple of hours. I don't know what you were thinking, but you are wrong. I will see you when I get there, and then we can talk. I love you, Jack. A very short time later, my cell phone rang again. Once more, I didn't answer it but let it go to voicemail. It was almost the same message, word for word. I wondered if she had written down what she was going to say. When I didn't answer that call, the text messages started coming through. She was a broken record, repeating almost verbatim what she had said in the voicemails. Since I didn't have to actually talk to her, I decided to send a short reply by text so she would know I received her messages but chose not to talk to her. I simply texted. I wonder if Mario would have any idea what you're talking about, honey. If I asked him, why don't you have him call me, and I will ask him. What I said about not coming back to the house is true. You cannot come home. It is over, Kelly. I didn't get any more texts, but I did get another phone call from Kelly later that afternoon. She left a message. Jack, we need to talk. I am staying with Amber until you and I talk and put this awful misunderstanding behind us. Please call my cell phone and talk to me. That was Sunday afternoon, and I did not return the call. The next morning, I went to my bank and arranged for a second safe deposit box in my name only. I put one copy of the DVDs in the box, along with the original of my prenuptial agreement. I had arranged for a meeting with my lawyer at 11 a.m., so I made an additional copy of the prenuptial agreement. He had one, I was sure, but I didn't want to take a chance on there being any problems. At the appointed time, I walked into my lawyer's office and found Kelly sitting there. She looked up at me when I walked in, and I could see that she looked like hell. It was obvious she had been crying, her hair was unkempt, and she had dark circles under her eyes from lack of sleep. She always got that way when she was overtired. Kelly said to me, Jack, we have to talk about this. I asked, how did you know I was coming here? She said, Richard called me when you made the appointment. At that time, Richard Warner, my attorney, came out into the reception area and asked us both to come into his office. My anger was seething beneath the surface, so I said, No, Richard, we will not be going into your office together. You have broken my trust by calling Kelly, and I need a straight answer from you right this moment. Are you going to represent me, only me? You know, lawyers are supposed to be so damn smart, but this guy must have gotten short-changed in the distribution of brains because he said, No. Jack, if this continues, I will be representing Kelly. It turns out he thought the grain business was a better client for him than my farm business. It actually may have been because, besides the grain business, he had all of the Gentry family members too. I had my opinion on that issue and felt that he would eventually realize the error of his thinking. Fine, Richard. Please have all of my original documents in your possession, as well as all copies of contracts and other paperwork of mine that you have available to me by 4 p.m. today. I will either stop by to pick them up or have a courier drop by. I just want you to know that I have appreciated the work you have done for me in the past, but you are making a big mistake here. Richard, I will be seeking legal services elsewhere, and my new attorney will be contacting you as soon as possible. Kelly had stood quietly during this entire exchange but now pleadingly asked, Jack, why won't you talk to me now to clear this up? Because, Kelly, it is obvious that Richard values you more as a client than he values me, and I will not have this conversation with you without legal representation. I wouldn't trust him. Richard piped up, Jack, you know I have always been straight with you, so you have nothing at all to fear. Oh, Richard, I have lots to fear. You cannot serve two masters. So they say, and it is clear whom you have chosen to be the master in this. Besides, you have already proven you can't be trusted when you called Kelly in here. Goodbye. My attorney will be in touch. I could hear Kelly beginning to cry again as I walked out the door. Now I had to find a new attorney. I knew that David Warner was a very able attorney and highly competitive with Richard Warner. I figured he might be a good choice, but I wouldn't dive in without doing some checking. Attorneys, accountants, bankers, and insurance agents are people you get into bed with, and you better really know what you have before you pull back the covers. I realize that attorney-client relationships are crucial because they almost always involve privileged information. I knew a few people who had used David, so I called his law office and asked if they had a list of references. 
The secretary said they did and gladly agreed to email it to me. There were four friends of mine on the list, so I decided to visit three of them to get their opinions on David's work. It didn't take long because each of the three quickly gave me a glowing recommendation for David. There was no doubt in my mind that he would do a good job for me. I didn't go see the fourth friend because it was Wally, and I didn't want to get him involved since he is married to Amber, Kelly's sister. I called David's office the second time, gave my name, and asked if I could make an appointment to see him after 4 p.m. The receptionist told me that he was busy until 4.30 p.m., but she would check with him to see if he could see me after that. I realized there was a chance he might not see me, but I had to try. When she came back on the line, she said that Mr. Warner would indeed see me at 4.30 p.m., but it would have to be a short meeting as he had other obligations in the evening. I agreed to that and told her I would be there shortly before 4.30 p.m. She said, I look forward to seeing you at that time, Mr. Hagen. By the way, my name is Samantha. I am David's wife. At 4 p.m., I stopped by Richard's office to pick up my paperwork, but they hadn't copied it all yet. It was obvious they had been stalling, hoping I would change my mind. I have to tell you that I blew up big time and told them I had better have every piece of my legal paperwork in the next 15 minutes or my new attorney would be contacting them. They asked me who that might be, and I told them they would find out soon enough. Well, that office was bustling after that. I think they had three people making copies at one time, and 20 minutes later, I had every sheet. I still had time to get to David's office by my appointment time, so I didn't raise any more fuss about being late on my deadline. I had my meeting with David, and he agreed to become my personal and business attorney. I asked him if I could leave all the paperwork I had obtained with him for safekeeping, and he agreed to put it in his vault until we had time to go over it together. We set an appointment for the next day, Tuesday at 9 a.m., to review all the paperwork and set a plan for my divorce. When I walked out of the office at 5.30 p.m., I smiled at Samantha and asked, Well, Samantha, am I in trouble, or are your evening plans still okay? She grinned back at me and said, You did just fine, Mr. Hagen. Our evening will go just as planned. I wish all of our clients were as prompt as you have been, but please call me Sam from here on. Thank you, Sam. And please call me Jack. The next morning, we reviewed all of my business paperwork and contracts. I can't discuss it here, though, due to attorney-client privilege. I can tell you that David thought everything seemed to be in order from the business perspective. We broke for lunch, and David and Sam invited me to join them at the local diner. I agreed and met them there, since I wanted to stop at my bank before we resumed in the afternoon. They were a charming couple, and we had a very enjoyable lunch together. I found out they were both a few years ahead of me in school. David said he was actually in the same grade as Tom Gentry, but that they were not close. I guess they were both too competitive with each other. I learned they had been married about 10 years and had two daughters, ages 6 and 3. They showed me pictures, and the two little ones were very pretty. They took after their mom, too. I could see both had beautiful smiles, just like Sam. I think that lunch did me a world of good. It made the transition to working with my new attorney much easier. However, the downside of the lunch was that I realized my life partner wasn't there with me anymore. David and Sam were so awesome together and reminded me so much of how it had been with Kelly before I found out about her cheating. It just made me sad, and a couple of times I know my eyes missed it up. David didn't notice a thing, but I could see that Sam had noticed and had a concerned look on her face. After lunch, I stopped at the bank and made a few changes to protect my assets. I also picked up a $5,000 check payable to David Warner Law Offices. It would serve as a retainer for the work they would do for me in the near future. David hadn't asked for anything yet, but I knew he would appreciate the effort. I arrived back at the office at 1.30 p.m. to resume our meeting. Sam told me that David was on the phone and took me to the small conference room we had been using. She asked if I wanted any coffee or anything else, and I told her I was fine. She sat down beside me and reached out her hand. David didn't tell me what's going on, Jack, but I can guess what this afternoon is going to be about based on your reactions at lunch. I see you're wearing a wedding ring, so I'm guessing it has to do with your wife. If you'll allow me, I'm going to ask David to let me sit in here with you this afternoon while we deal with whatever you have to tell us. I was on the verge of breaking down again, so I just nodded my agreement. 
My anger had waned for the time being, and I guess the emotions of the hour were stronger now. It would be good to have a woman's sensitivity nearby. I realized I might need Sam's sympathetic presence during the meeting. I told the entire story about discovering Kelly's cheating. I broke down a couple of times, and Sam stepped in to offer sympathy and comfort. Once I regained control of my emotions, I informed them of my intentions. Unless something came up to change my mind, I planned to file for divorce and enforce the terms of the prenuptial agreement. David and I reviewed the prenuptial agreement in detail. The terms are pretty much as follows. I keep 100% of all farm assets, real estate, and personal property. Kelly keeps 100% of grain business assets. Kelly gets 50% of our financial assets if there has been no infidelity. If there has been infidelity, Kelly only gets $25,000 for each year of unfaithfulness, not 50%. Household personal property is split 50% regardless of the circumstances. Jack, I need you to show me proof of infidelity, David said. No, David. I have the proof, but I will not show it to you now or to anyone else unless we are forced to go to court. Then I will show it to the judge. David insisted, Jack. I need to see it to be sure we have a case of infidelity. I need to be sure. David, you need to trust me. I have the proof, but I loved Kelly, and I don't want anyone seeing what I have seen unless it is absolutely necessary. Sam touched David on the arm and nodded her head. David reluctantly agreed. During the next couple of days, Kelly called me several times and left messages. I never took her calls and deleted the messages without listening to them. David called me and said, We have set a meeting for Thursday at 10.30 a.m. with you, Kelly, and Richard. David and I drove over to Richard's office to meet with him and Kelly. When we arrived, I saw that Kelly's car was already in the parking lot, so we went into the office. Richard's receptionist ushered us back to a small conference room where we waited only a couple of minutes before Richard and Kelly came in. Kelly looked a lot better than she had when I saw her at Richard's office earlier in the week. Obviously, she had fixed herself up for the meeting because she was, in fact, beautiful. I did everything I could to keep my feelings hidden because I didn't want her to see how my heart ached for her. She smiled at me and said, Jack, I hope we can finally talk and get this misunderstanding behind us. I miss you and want to come home. I didn't respond to her because I felt my voice would crack if I said anything at the moment. I needed to get my emotions under control. It wouldn't be easy, but I had to do it. David spoke up, we are here to discuss the divorce proceedings for the dissolution of Jack and Kelly's marriage. I believe we should open up the discussion, giving each party time to express their thoughts and opinions about how this couple should move forward in their lives. Richard nodded and interjected, my client feels this is a total misunderstanding and welcomes the opportunity to clear the air and talk to her husband. I had been having a hard time controlling my emotions, but Richard did me a big favor by igniting my anger again. Right now, it was at the boiling point. I knew I could control the anger, which made it easier to manage my emotions, hurt, and disappointment in Kelly. I would be okay. That is fine with me, Richard. Your client can talk to her husband. I looked across the table at Kelly and said, Kelly, here are some facts. When we married, we signed a prenuptial agreement and we modified it two years ago when you bought into your father's business. I have brought along copies of the modified agreement for all parties to have. Kelly looked on in shock and quietly said, But Jack, I don't want a divorce. I want to be your wife. Why can't we just get past this misunderstanding and go home and be happy again? I pretty much glazed over that comment and continued, Our intention was to protect individual interests while still reaping the benefits of our marriage. Originally, the prenuptial agreement was to protect assets held in my family over several generations. Then, when you bought into your father's business, it was also to protect the same assets long held in your family in the event of a divorce. Our agreement clearly spells out that I will retain 100% of the assets from my family, and you will retain 100% of the assets from your family. All debt pertaining to those business assets will accrue to the business, and the other party will have no responsibility. Because we jointly work to provide our marital assets, our agreement calls for certain monetary and property splits depending on the circumstances of our divorce. As this document clearly shows, you are entitled to all of your personal items, including clothing, 
jewelry, your car, and other items that a man would have no interest in. Likewise, I have the same entitlement on my side. All other non-farm personal property, such as furniture, artwork, electronics, etc., is to be split 50 50ths. Farm personal property, such as grain bins and machinery, is to remain 100% mine, as it is an integral part of the farming operation. The monetary distribution to you in the event of a divorce is 50% of financial assets if there has been no infidelity. There are two exceptions to that distribution in the event of infidelity, as you can see in the document. If you divorce me for infidelity, the distribution would be $25,000 per year, or $200,000 total, not 50%. If I divorce you for infidelity, the distribution would be $25,000 per year, or $200,000 total, not 50%. I'm going to ask you some questions, Kelly. How you answer these questions will determine whether I pursue the divorce and on what grounds. Obviously, that will also determine the outcome of any monetary distributions. If our marriage is going to have any chance of surviving, Kelly, you must answer each question with complete honesty. If you refuse to answer or I catch you in any lie, it is over. Is that understood? Are you willing to do that to have a chance to save our marriage? Kelly had been sitting there, looking completely stunned by my recitation of our prenuptial agreement. She quickly snapped out of it and responded, Yes, Jack, I will answer your questions, and I will answer them honestly. I love you, and I want our marriage to survive. I will do anything to get you to stop this and allow me to come back home. Kelly, I would like to tape record these questions. Is that acceptable to you? This time, she hesitated a bit and turned to Richard, who had pretty much remained silent up until this point. Richard, being a typical lawyer, said, Kelly, I would advise against that, but you do what you feel is important to you. With that, my lawyer David piped up, Well, Kelly, I agree with Richard and would advise you and my client not to tape this, but it is Jack who needs to be convinced, not Richard or I. So do what you feel is right. Kelly said, I will do anything to get past this misunderstanding, so yes, go ahead and tape this. I am okay with taping any conversation between Jack and me. David and I had brought along a tape recorder, so we placed it on the table where all voices would be picked up by the microphones. Kelly asked, Jack, what are your questions? Kelly, I want to ask you if you have been faithful to me, but I want to ask it in three different time periods. The first time period is from the day we pledged to be exclusive with one another up until the day we were engaged. Were you faithful to me during that time period? Kelly smiled and said, Yes, Jack, I was faithful to you during that time period. She thought she was winning points now, but her smile quickly turned to shock when I said, Well, that is lie number one. You couldn't even answer the very first question honestly. I should get up and walk out right now, but I won't yet. Are you telling me you didn't have sex with Larry Evandale two days after we pledged exclusivity? Is that what you're telling me? Larry was that kind of guy, Kelly. He had to brag, and he in fact bragged to me that you invited him over to your house on a Tuesday night when your parents were going to be gone, and he screwed you silly on your own bed. Oh, and Kelly, he told me he didn't use a condom either. He grinned at me and said, it's a lot more fun when you are a 304. His parting shot at me before he walked away was, Jack, she really loved it, and I'm certain that I will get lots of repeat performances in the future, probably even after you marry the 304. Now, you could say he made it all up, but strangely enough, Amber was nearby and happened to overhear it all. She walked over to me after Larry left and said, Jack, Kelly loves you and she won't cheat on you again. She was just giving him a farewell sex. Please don't do anything stupid, and by the way, he lied. He did use condoms. I saw the packages in the trash the next morning. So, you see, Kelly, you have already lied to me, but I can understand what you did, even if I hated it. I am going to give you a pass on this lie, but there will be no more passes from here on. Tell me the truth, or suffer the consequences. After that event, I didn't trust you, so I watched you like a hawk for the next six months. For that entire six months, you did nothing to arouse my suspicions so I asked you to marry me and gave you the ring you have on your finger. For the time being, I knew you were probably hoping that would come quicker, but I wasn't ready to trust you yet, so you had to wait. Question number two, during our engagement, from the day you got the ring until our wedding day, did you cheat on me? 
Kelly never hesitated a second as she said, No, absolutely not. I knew what that answer was going to be, so I said, Well, I know that isn't true because you see, I still didn't trust you totally, so I continued to observe you for that entire year until I felt I could trust you. I was almost certain you were faithful to me during that time. Richard, to his credit, asked if we could take a break. He wanted to confer with his client and give her time to regroup. He had noticed, like me, that during my tirade about Larry Evandale, Kelly had become very emotional and was on the verge of breaking down. He wanted to give her a chance to compose herself before we continued. We took a break for lunch, and David and I drove by his office, picked up Sam, and went to the local diner for the Blue Plate special. Sam asked how it was going, and David said, I think Jack is doing fine. There hasn't been much come out yet, but he laid the groundwork for an honest answer for the marital period. If she admits all of it, he may still want to pursue the divorce, but he might also see that she truly wants to preserve her marriage. It will be a tough call, but I think he will be able to make it. Of course, if she lies, then Jack has to decide where to go from there. Sam looked over at me, and her intuition kicked in. I knew she saw my pain. I gave a weak smile and said, this is not an easy thing at all. Why on earth do people do such stupid things and cause so much pain in their own lives and in the lives of those they love? She reached her hand over on top of mine and said, if only we knew, Jack, we could slap them before they could be so stupid. Of course, that got me to laugh, as did David. Even in this difficult time, I could laugh. I guess that's a testament to the resiliency of humanity. People grieve at funerals, but they also laugh. I guess people grieve at divorces but can also laugh too. I smiled at Sam and said, Thanks, Sam. I really needed that. She just nodded. Shortly after 1 p.m., we returned to Richard's office for the meeting with Kelly. Before I asked the next question, I reminded Kelly, You need to answer these questions with total honesty. If you lie in any way, it will be the end of this meeting and no hope at all for our marriage. Do you understand this? Kelly said, Yes, I understand, and I will tell you the truth. Kelly, I asked, from the day we were married until this very moment, did you ever cheat on me? I saw tears well up in her eyes, and I felt so badly for her because I knew how painful it must be for her. But I couldn't comfort her or let her off the hook. I needed her to care enough about our marriage to confess everything. I didn't know if I could stop this divorce or not. If she told me the total truth, I would know that she cared enough to try to save our marriage. Yes, Jack, I did cheat on you, she responded. She dropped her head onto her crossed arms on the table and just sobbed. I am so sorry, Jack. Can you ever forgive me? I asked that Richard and David leave the room because I had a few more questions for Kelly and I didn't want to embarrass her in front of them. They both objected, but I insisted that David leave, and Kelly nodded to Richard that she wanted him to leave as well. I had her confession that she had cheated on me on tape. It would be all I needed in a divorce hearing, and I didn't want the rest of my questions and her answers on tape, so I turned it off. Kelly, answer these questions. When, where, who, and why? She sniffled a few times. Oh, Jack, I am so sorry. It happened this weekend at Princess Spa. One of the masseurs, named Mario, is who I cheated with. I don't know exactly why it happened, Jack. I guess passions of the moment would be the best way to describe the why. Amber and I had been enjoying the day so much, and after a wonderful dinner, we each decided to get a massage before we went to bed. My masseur was Mario. I was on the massage table in the room, lying on my stomach. Mario started the massage, and it felt so good. His hands were soft yet strong. He worked the muscles in my arms, shoulders, and back. He worked from my feet up my legs. He even worked my inner thighs but stopped short of becoming too intimate, if you know what I mean. Then he started working on my back and shoulders again, as I was still tense in those areas. I felt him untie my bikini top and pull the sides down. I have to confess it felt great, and I did nothing to stop him. At that moment, I had no idea I would get in over my head with that. She started to cry again. Oh, Jack, if I could go back, I never would have allowed it and we wouldn't be where we are now. You have to believe me. Even though it was killing me to hear all this, 
I wanted to hear the story she was telling, not out of lust or a desire to get turned on, but because I wanted to know what she would tell me. Go on, Kelly, tell me the rest, I urged. There is nothing more to elaborate on, we just had sex, she said. I sat there for a moment, hoping she would continue, but she didn't say another word and just sat there with her head down, sniffling. Finally, she raised her head and looked at me with a questioning look. Jack, is there any hope that you will forgive me? She asked. I didn't want to make it sound like we were in court, but in fact, we kind of were, so I asked her, Kelly, is this the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? She looked at me with what I would describe as a strange look, a look of wonderment, as if she had a question but no way to ask it. It was kind of an I wonder how much he knows look. Finally, she said, Jack, that is what happened. I am so sorry. At that moment, my heart was breaking. Against all odds, I was able to hide both the pain of her betrayal and the anger at her lies and keep my cool. I got up from the table, walked over to the door, and summoned David and Richard back into the room. This meeting is over, I said, looking at both men. With that, I turned to Kelly and said, I am divorcing you on the grounds of infidelity. The terms of the prenuptial agreement will be enforced. She was shocked and asked, but why, Jack? I confessed my cheating, and I am begging you to forgive me and go on with our marriage. Please, Jack, please. I love you so much. Please forgive me. Kelly, you lied to me. You didn't care enough about our marriage to lay it all on the line. If you had, I'm not sure I could have stayed married to you, but you never even gave it a chance. You had it all in your own hands and lied. I know you cheated more than the one time with Mario, and I have the proof. I warned you that you had to tell the truth, and you didn't care enough about me and our marriage to do that. It is over. I turned back around, opened the door, and started to walk through. She screamed, Wait, Jack. I will tell you everything, everything you want to know. Please don't leave me. I spun around once again and glared at her with all the hurt and anger I could muster. You were warned. You had your chance and thought you could get away with only one episode, so you lied. You had your chance, Kelly. I screamed back at her. It is over. David hurried after me and finally caught up with me as I was getting into my car. He grabbed my arm and asked, Do you really want to file on the grounds of infidelity? Yes, I do. She had her chance. Somehow, I must have misjudged her all these years. I wanted her to care enough to confess everything, but she couldn't even be honest with me. Now go ahead and file. I drove out to our house, my house now, and grabbed a beer from the refrigerator. Actually, I grabbed two and went into my office. I sat at my desk and practically chugged down the first one. Then I drank the second one more slowly as I sat and reflected on all that had happened. I had multiple copies of the video download squirreled away in safe places but I didn't think I would need to make that public because I had her confession. My head snapped up when I realized I had walked out of the office without the tape. I quickly called David and said, David, did you pick up the tape recording of Kelly's confession before you came running after me? Oh, Jack, he said, no, I didn't. I rushed out after you to catch you and completely forgot about the tape. I am so sorry. I was so careful in everything I planned, and then because I was hurt and angry all at the same time, I screwed everything up by charging out of there without my tape. Damn, I said. Well, David, why don't you give Richard a call and see if you can run over there and pick it up? But my guess is that their answer will be something like this. We thought you had everything you needed when you left, so we just erased everything. Sorry. I will be shocked if you actually get it. But don't worry even if you don't get it because I have plenty of evidence to file for infidelity anyway. Okay, man. I am sorry. I know you didn't want to use the video downloads, and now you might have to if she fights the infidelity charge, David said. Don't worry about it, David. Everything will work out. After I hung up with David, I went to the refrigerator and got another beer. Damn, how could I be so stupid? I wasn't drunk, but I was feeling no pain as I sat and watched the evening news before going to bed. I thought I heard a vehicle come onto the yard, so I slowly pulled myself up and out of my chair and went to the back door. I walked out onto the porch and saw a dark form. Moments before the lights went out, 
something hit me on the back of the head. All I saw was blinding light, and then I drifted off into total darkness. Beep 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 is what I heard. It didn't take me long to realize that the beeping was close beside me. I opened my eyes and tried to turn slightly to my right to see what it was when the excruciating pain hit me full force. I thought my chest was going to explode, and the pain shot straight up into my head, creating flashes of blue and silver stars. What the hell? I thought. I heard a slight rustling nearby and felt a surge of something in my body, and then I was out again. The next time I heard the beeping, I opened my eyes and looked around as best as I could without moving. I had learned my lesson from the first time. I saw a nurse sitting in the chair beside me. I tried to turn again slowly, but I couldn't. Hi, Jack. I'm Susan, and I'm your nurse. Please don't try to move, okay? Everything is going to be okay, and I will explain everything to you, but please, lay still. Do you understand me? I think something was jammed down my throat, but I was able to nod my head a little, so I nodded to show that I understood. Jack, I need to go tell the doctor that you have regained consciousness, and then we'll be right back in here, okay? Again, I nodded that I understood. It was finally dawning on me that I must be hurt and in the hospital, but I couldn't recall anything about how it had happened. I guessed that someone would eventually tell me, so I just lay there with my eyes closed until I heard them approaching me again. Mr. Hagen, Jack, I'm Dr. Julius. You have had several serious injuries as a result of a beating during the robbery of your home. Now that you have come around, I'm very certain that you will be okay, but you had to be restrained so you wouldn't re-injure yourself by excessive movements. I'm sure you felt the extreme pain when you tried to move yesterday, am I right? I had no reason to smile, but a slight smile came to my face as I once again nodded my affirmative to the pain. Yes, we should have been a bit more proactive with the restraints so you didn't have to go through that pain. I'm sorry. I think we can take off the restraints now, Nurse Johnson. But Mr. Hagen, do not try to do anything on your own yet, okay? I nodded and also pointed to the tube down my throat. Yes, we can also remove the ventilator now. Nurse Johnson will do it. The restraints were removed, and the tube was taken out as well. My throat was killing me, and I couldn't speak. I was given a sip of water, and after a short time, I could talk, but my voice was really scratchy and it hurt a lot, so I just whispered, Will someone tell me what happened to me, please? Dr. Julius said, Jack, it's 7 a.m., and you have just regained consciousness and gotten off the ventilator. Your throat is going to hurt for a few hours at least, and we just want you to rest for now. Nurse Johnson is going to sit with you, and after you've had a chance to rest, we need to let the police know that you are able to talk. I'll give you a while before we make that call so you can recover some, but you will need to talk to them, and they will be able to tell you everything that happened. Medically, you have some serious injuries, including a concussion, three broken ribs, and multiple contusions. You also had a punctured lung from one of your ribs that caused your lung to deflate, but EMTs got to you in time to resuscitate you. After repairing the damage to your lung, we were able to reinflate it. You were actually pretty lucky, Jack. If you hadn't been found quickly, you most certainly would have died. To put it bluntly, you've been beaten up about as thoroughly as possible. You were unconscious for five days, came to for a couple of minutes yesterday, and were out again until today. We are going to monitor you closely for a few more days, and then you will probably be free to go home. As promised, I had the rest of that day to rest, with Nurse Johnson sitting close by the entire time. Anytime I moved quickly, I experienced pretty severe pain, so I lay pretty still. By later that afternoon, I was able to sit up and, with a great deal of assistance, use the facilities. Susan, Nurse Johnson, and I had some time to talk, and I found out that she had been about three years behind me in school. Her name then was Susan Fisk, and she had married Chad Johnson. She had a three-year-old daughter, Emily. Apparently, Chad had been like Kelly and had been cheating on Susan, so she divorced him. I told her what had been going on with Kelly, and of course, she was quite sympathetic. The next morning, bright and early, I was entertaining two police detectives, Harold Robbins and Josh Carter. I asked them to fill me in on what had happened to me before they got too far into asking questions. Detective Robbins said, Well, apparently, it was a robbery that resulted in an assault on you. We found a 2x4 on the porch alongside you, and it had your hair and blood on it. 
There were no fingerprints on it, so we assumed whoever wielded it had been wearing gloves. The door to your house showed no signs of forced entry, but that's because you came out onto the porch and the door was already open. He continued, when we searched the house, we discovered that a number of pictures had been removed from the walls. There was an empty strongbox in one of the desk drawers. All the file cabinets in the office had been ransacked, the drawers and closets in the bedrooms had been searched, and there were empty drawers and racks from a jewelry box in the master bedroom. We see evidence of a robbery, but of course, we don't have a clue about what was actually taken. Detective Carter jumped in. When you are able to go home, you will need to look things over and determine to the best of your ability what has been taken. The doctor told us that it might be three or four more days before you're able to go home. At that time, we will have you go over everything with us, and we will update the reports. Robbins took over again. It's time to ask some questions. What do you remember of the attack and what happened afterward? Well, I said, not much, I'm afraid. I had had a couple of beers and was watching the evening news when I heard a vehicle drive onto the yard. I got up to see what it was and stepped out onto the porch. I saw the hint of a person, kind of in shadows or darkness, and then the lights went out. I can't recall seeing or hearing anything else until yesterday. I'm afraid I won't be much help in solving who did this. Well, Robin said, I think we still need to ask you a few questions, which should help us work through this. Where was your wife when this happened? My wife and I are separated. We're in the process of getting a divorce, so I actually have no idea where she was at the time, I said. Tell me, Mr. Hagen, can I call you Jack? Yes, of course you can. Is your divorce proceeding amicably, or is there contention between the two of you? I guess I'd have to say it isn't going well. She is contesting the grounds that I'm planning on filing under. And what grounds will those be, Jack? I'm going to file on the grounds of infidelity. We have a prenuptial agreement, and her settlement is significantly less under those terms of divorce, so that's what she is contesting. Well, if I might say so, that gives her plenty of reasons to do you harm, detective, I added. I just don't believe she would do anything to hurt me. I can't believe it. That's okay, he interjected. It's something we will look at very closely. However, to conduct a thorough investigation, are there any other people who might have a reason to do this to you? Do you have any business relationships that may have gone bad? Have you had any disagreements with neighbors, friends, family, or anyone else? No, I can't think of anything. Okay, Jack. I know we will have to take a complete inventory of what was taken when you're able, but there are two things I want to ask about now. Did you have any cash in the house, perhaps in the strong box, and how much would it have been? Also, did you have anything else in the house, including jewelry and artworks, that would have had significant value? I'm talking about thousands of dollars or more. Yes, there was some cash in the strong box. I would say it was upwards of $8,000. I usually keep around $10,000 in cash on hand, but I know I've paid some things out of it recently, so it's probably at about $8,000. There were some nice pieces of jewelry, but maybe only a few over $11,000. There was nothing else of significant value that I can think of at the moment. I didn't tell them about the hidden safe behind the bookcase yet because, firstly, the detectives never mentioned it, and secondly, I was pretty certain that no one would have found it. I wanted to keep that a secret if at all possible. Well, Jack, I think that will be it for today. If you think of anything else, please don't hesitate to call me. When you're ready to go home, let me know so we can do that inventory. If we have any other questions, we will stop by here or at your home if you're there over the next four days. I got progressively better. I had plenty of nap time most days, but some of the time I sat and talked with Susan. I had several visitors, including Wally, Amber, David, and Sam. Kelly did not come to see me, and other than Amber, none of her family came either. I suppose that was understandable under the circumstances, but I would have actually welcomed the visit. Richard, Kelly's attorney, did come to see me. We had been friends for years before this whole divorce thing started, and I was glad he came. Everyone told me how sorry they were that I had been injured and wished me well. Both Amber and Sam kissed me on the cheek before they left, and they both had tears welling up in their eyes. I had some difficult times over those four days. Though I slept, 
I know that some of the time I was having bad dreams. I would wake up in a panic with my heart racing and felt tears in my own eyes a few times. When I awoke, I wasn't sure where I was, but it seemed that Susan was always there to soothe me with soft words and touches. At least once, I know I woke myself up screaming, but I don't recall any of the bad dreams or the reason for the screams. I found out later that she stayed at the hospital with me even when she was off duty and only went home to clean up and change clothes each day. She told me it was because of the events of my marriage that were especially close to her heart, and she wanted to be there for me. I really appreciated that. Dr. Julia stopped by to let me know I was going to be discharged. I was happy about that and immediately started to get ready to leave. Susan helped me get ready and actually wheeled me down to the lobby and out the door, where Wally and Amber were waiting to take me home. She wished me good luck and gave me a big hug. I knew she really cared about me, and I was thankful for her, but my life was in turmoil, including my marriage and my health, so I didn't pursue any further relationship with her. I told her I would like to call her sometime in the future, and that was it. When I walked into my house, I could see the mess that was still there. Wally and Amber offered to help me straighten up, but I told them I would rather leave it as it was for the time being until I had looked everything over. I promised them that I would call them to come help me when I was ready. They reluctantly agreed and left me alone. The first thing I did was walk into the office and check on the safe behind the bookcase. Everything was in there, including quite a bit more cash, certificates of deposit, and some stocks and bonds. It was obvious that no one had found the safe, otherwise, those things would have been taken. The DVD of Kelly's infidelity was safely there as well. I looked through the rest of the office, and other than the cash, my laptop computer, and a few numbered prints of wildlife by Terry Redland, nothing appeared to be missing. I did notice that bank statements and credit card statements were laid out on the desk, so I'm sure someone must have looked through them. I called both the bank and the credit card company to alert them that my account numbers might have been compromised and to be on the lookout for unusual activity. After a couple of weeks, the investigation into the robbery and beating was moving slowly because the police really had no evidence that would connect to anyone. Detectives Robbins and Carter updated me often on the status of their work, but so far no additional leads had come up. They did mention that because there were no high-value items taken, it was a dead end trying to trace things through fences like they do in some crimes. On their last call, they both pretty much indicated that it would be put on the back burner unless some meaningful evidence came to light. In the initial stages of the investigation, they had asked some serious questions about Kelly and me. I had been open and upfront with them in most instances. One thing I felt pretty strongly about was that Kelly wouldn't have hurt me. Why take things she would have gotten in the divorce anyway? I guess the detectives agreed with that reasoning too, because nothing came of it. I had established new bank accounts and had new checks printed because I felt my old accounts had been compromised somewhat. Fortunately, there was no activity that I couldn't explain, but I still felt safer establishing the new ones. I had purchased a new laptop computer and had reorganized everything in the office. I was back in business. I sat down to pay some of the bills that had piled up while I was out of it and came across a bill from RSS Incorporated. A light bulb clicked on in my head. For the first time since the robbery, I remembered that RSS stood for Remote Electronic Data Storage Solutions. I had video surveillance of my yard, which encompassed the house, the grain bins, and the machine shed. The video feed went into the computer in my grain office out by the bins and dryer. Every night, that feed was uploaded to our RSS storage backup system. It was retained by them, and I paid a monthly fee based on the amount of data retained. Every month, I would go in and delete the oldest data to keep the fees manageable. I hadn't deleted anything from the time of the robbery. I had video. I immediately logged onto the website for our RSS and selected the day of the robbery from the archives. I downloaded the entire day onto my laptop so I could view it. I was hoping that the quality would be good enough to identify who had beaten and robbed me. If it was good, I would copy it onto a DVD and give it to Detectives Robbins and Carter. That would get the investigation going again. As I scanned through the footage, I realized there was nothing there that I could give to the detectives. I knew now that they would never solve the crime. The rest of the bills were paid, and I started planning how I was going to move forward with the rest of my life. 
I decided to make contact with an old friend of mine from college days who worked for Caril, one of the largest grain merchandisers in the U.S. Through them, I arranged to meet with the powers that be in their acquisition department. It's amazing what people connections can do to make things happen. After about two weeks, I had worked through my plans with Caril and took a little side trip to Las Vegas. I ended up flying to Phoenix because I had some business there and then drove up to Vegas to do a little gambling. After two days, I flew back home and put all of my plans into action. I called David and had him contact Gentry Grain to set up a meeting for me with Kelly, her brothers Tom and Carl, and her sister Amber. I told him to mention that with the impending divorce, the grain reserves required by the state would no longer be sufficient because they wouldn't be able to include my grain stored there. I had David tell them that I wanted to sit down and discuss the situation with them and come to some resolution. I think David shocked them because they readily agreed to meet with me. I guess they hadn't considered what would happen if my grain was no longer part of the equation. I walked into the office and greeted them all. Hello, Tom, Carl, Amber, Kelly. I guess you understand one of the reasons I felt we should sit down and resolve some issues. Tom started to say something, but I held up my hand and said, I think I called this meeting, and I suggest you all just sit here and listen to what I have to say before you make any comments. I honestly think it will be in everyone's best interest if you do that first. I would like to put this divorce to bed, if you will. Sorry about the dig, Kelly. I put the last draft of the divorce papers on the table in front of Kelly and said, Sign these, please. She replied, Jack, I don't want a divorce. Whatever you think I did was not worth throwing away all the good years we had, and I wish you could forgive me and work through our problems. I certainly don't want to do this here in front of my brothers and sister. Kelly, we're going to finish this now. There is no tomorrow for our marriage, and the sooner you sign these papers, the quicker we can both get on with our lives. She flushed red and blurted out, Well, if you must divorce me, I still plan on fighting the infidelity issue. That is the least you can do for me. I knew she would play that card, but I was, of course, ready for it. If you choose to fight me on the infidelity issue, Kelly, I will have no recourse but to submit this DVD into evidence before the court. I threw a copy of the DVD onto the table with the divorce papers. In case you're wondering what it is, it's a video of all eight, yes, I said eight, times you cheated on me at the spa. Amber's face turned brilliant red, and she shot daggers at Kelly. You didn't, Kelly? How could you do that? You told me you did the same thing I did when approached and shut them down. How could you do that to Jack? Yes, Amber, she did do that. She slept with Mario the first night when Stephen approached you, then she slept with Stephen the next night. On your second visit, she slept with Mario all three nights. On this recent visit, she slept with him three times. So, yes, eight videos of her sleeping with Mario and Steve should clear up my infidelity issue quite well. Sign the damn divorce papers right now, Kelly, or I will go to court with this. I am done messing around with you. I could see that Tom and Carl were also in shock, and Amber was quietly crying while Kelly signed the divorce papers. I left her one copy and put the rest in my briefcase. Kelly had a numb look on her face and there were unshed tears in her eyes. For what? I couldn't be sure, but it didn't matter. I could see that she was shocked that I had the evidence to prove multiple incidents of infidelity, but she wasn't done being shocked yet. Now, let's move on to the other issue for us, the grain issue. I can tell you're all in shock by what I just told you, so I'm going to make this quick but unfortunately, worse. The bad news is that with this divorce, you will no longer have the value of my stored grain included with your reserves, and will be in violation of your grain license and your loan covenants. The good news is that I went to your father and presented my case to him, and he agreed to sell me his 52% interest in the business. Your agreement with him had no clause for first right of refusal, so I guess Richard didn't do the best job for you in the purchase after all. I didn't show him evidence of your cheating, but he believed I had it, so to him, this was a no-brainer. He knew the company would be in trouble without my equity, so he sold me his stock, and now I am the majority shareholder in Gentry Grain Incorporated. You each own 12% and as a group, are in the minority position with 48%. The bad news is that I have negotiated a deal to sell my controlling interest in Gentry Grain to Cargo. They are always on the lookout for up-and-coming grain operations, 
and Gentry Grain fills the bill at the right price. The good news is that you have the option to sell your shares to them for the same price I negotiated. It is my recommendation that you do that. I negotiated a very good price. The bad news is that now your company is owned by someone else, and they will be evaluating personnel to see who adds value to the company. The good news is that as part of my negotiations, you each have guaranteed employment during that time. I highly recommend that you bust your asses to prove to them that you are valuable employees. Just so you know, I have also sold my farm to them, and Wally has sold his farm to them as well. Wally has signed a long-term contract with Cargo to manage both farms, and we all know what a great job he does and will continue to do for them. The shock I had noted on all of their faces deepened, turning into a degree of rage as well. Tom, being the oldest and the unofficial leader of the Gentry clan, was the first to speak. What the hell have you done, Jack? You've destroyed this family business because my sister cheated on you. What kind of man are you? How did you get my father to sell you his shares? What kind of lies did you tell him? I'll tell you what, Tom, I said. First, your father sold me his stock to keep you out of jail, to keep Carl out of jail, and to keep Kelly out of jail. You ask what kind of man I am, but you should be asking yourself what kind of man you are, what kind of man your brother is, and what kind of woman your sister is. I toss the second DVD onto the middle of the table. I think this video will give you all the answers you need as to why this is all happening. It clearly shows your pickup on my yard the night I was beaten. It clearly shows you and Carl beating me. It clearly shows you coming out of my house with my belongings. Consider yourselves lucky that I chose this route of revenge instead of turning this over to Detectives Robbins and Carter. Kelly finally spoke up. Jack, how can you do this to me? Kelly, you're another case altogether. With you, I feel like I wasted my whole life. Your father always treated my dad well enough, but he always kind of looked down on him like a second-class farm boy. Tom and Carl treated me the same way, always thinking they were too good for me. You were my best friend, but you also considered yourself better than me in many ways. I could always tell you were deceitful. You promised to be exclusive with me and immediately slept with Larry Evandale. You were a cheating wife, disrespecting me in our marriage by sleeping with those men. When you watch that video, remember that I saw every second and heard every word. And worst of all, Kelly, you were a lousy best friend. You know I almost died in the attack. One of my broken ribs punctured a lung and it deflated. If the paramedics hadn't gotten to me when they did, I would have died. Interestingly enough, Tom and Carl broke my ribs, but it was the three or four kicks from your booted foot that drove the broken rib into my lung. You, Kelly, almost killed the man you say you love so much. I would call that being a pretty rotten friend, don't you think? Kelly fainted, and Amber and Carl rushed to catch her before she fell out of her chair. Then Amber went to get a cold cloth to help revive her. When she was conscious again, I took my final shot. So, you now know your father sold me his stock to keep all three of you out of jail. He isn't very proud of his children, you know, except you, Amber, and I'm sure you'll hear plenty about that in the future. Like I said before, I believe I have wasted most of my life on you, Kelly, but I won't be wasting any more of my future. Have a great life. With that, I walked out the door. With all deals done, I was free to move on. Kelly and I got divorced, and I now held the majority stake in the company. A few months after the divorce, all the siblings were arrested for the assault on me. Apparently, someone had sent the assault video to the cops. Kelly's father was upset with me and came to confront me at my office. He entered the office screaming, but unfortunately, he had a stroke just before I could come out. Karma has strange ways, I guess.